Today we have a special lesson on the slide rule. The use of the slide rule. Before taking up the slide rule proper, it is essential that we learn the difference between significant figures and non-significant figures. And to illustrate this, I have on the board a set of numbers. The first set of numbers involve three significant figures. Here is 235. There are three numbers here, three figures. Here is 23.5. This is three significant figures. 2.35 or 0.235. See, the decimal point has just been moved over one, two, three, and so on. All of these involve three significant figures. The decimal point position makes no difference in significant figures. Here's 0 0.0235 or 000, 00235 or 235,000, the decimal point way over here. All of these involve three significant figures only. Here in the 235,000, if one were making a measurement and one could determine 235 something, and then you found later that the decimal point had to be over here, but all you, you could only measure to three figures, then this would only be correct to three figures. Yet you'd write in the zeros because the magnitude of the entire number is 235,000. So the zeros following the 235 are not significant unless you can measure to that accuracy of one part in 200,000. And very few experiments permit such accurate measurements. Now here again is a set of four numbers, four significant figures, 3,195. Or if you move the decimal point over and get 3,195, this is four significant figures. Or here, 0.3195. Or 0 0.003195. Four significant figures. These are the only significant ones. Or 3,195,000. Only four significant figures. Now, suppose the zeros were between two numbers instead of uh, the right or left. That's a different story. Here's 2,004. The zeros become, are between the two numbers. The four is significant here because one was able to measure this to determine its number four here. Or we might read 20.04 as a measurement, or 0 0.2004. And here again, three zeros, 2004. Here the zeros are significant, here they are not. And here again, 20,040,000. These first four figures are significant. These numbers are not. Usually if they're in front or behind, they are not significant figures. Now the slide rule is capable of three significant figures, and that's why I illustrated these by numbers so you would know the difference. Let me illustrate why three significant figures are of general importance in most measurements. Suppose one were going to make a me measure of the area of this rectangle. Normally, you would use a ruler or a meter stick and measure the length and the width or height. Suppose you measured the length and found it to be 345 millimeters and the width or height 234 millimeters. Then you would multiply these two numbers together to find the area in square millimeters. Well, now here I've done that. I've multiplied 345 by 234. And carrying out the arithmetic uh, as an answer, got 80730, 80,730. Now suppose I had made an error, or instead of reading the, w the length as 345, suppose I had read 344, a difference of only one millimeter. Now, then suppose I read this width as 234 and then multiply those two numbers together, 344 by 234, and get 80,496. Look at the difference now that that one millimeter made. Here's 80,496 and here's 80,730. This is a seven here in the third place and this is, well, roughly this nine would make that a five. This is 805, roughly. 
So 805 and 807, you see, makes a difference of two figures in the third significant figure. So in this case, these last two numbers mean nothing. It is only the third figure that is significant, and even that is not quite correct. It's off by a, a little uh, more than the number, the original number, 345 or 344. Now suppose we had read instead of 345, 346, a millimeter too long. Then we would multiply 346 times 234 and get 80,096, 80,964. Again, you see the third figure is off by about two numbers, 807, 809. So again, our answer is only uh, somewhere nearly correct to the third significant figure. So uh, the last numbers here are not important. One could just as well write this 80700, 0, because we only know these numbers to within one in the third significant figure. Now the position of the decimal point has no bearing upon this result. Now we're ready to go to the slide rule proper. And the slide rule is a, enables you to carry out four different processes as a rule. There are others, but these are the important ones. Multiplication, division, square root, and squares. Now slide rules in general consist of three parts. They consist of three parts. The body of the slide rule, the slip stick, and the slider. The body of the rule, the slip stick, and the slider. Now here is a very large slide rule that I'm going to use. But I would like to show you some very small ones first. The type that you nor normally buy at the store. And those I have picked out. First, a very inexpensive one, about, oh, nine inches long. This little slide rule will enable you to carry out about 95% about 95% of the operations you normally want to perform. Multiplication, division, squares, and square roots. It costs only 50 cents. So a slide rule comes within the range of everyone's pocketbook. And with it came a little instruction book. Now here is a more expensive slide rule, about 10 inches long. See, they're about the same in length. This one has a few more scales on it. This rule will cost you anywhere from 35 to $50. But there are very few additional things that you would ever want to do that you would, that you would require such a slide rule. 90 to 95 percent of the things you want to do can be done with an inexpensive one. But if you want to buy a little better one, you can do so. And the accuracy of both of these slide rules is approximately three significant figures. Now, of course, the numbers are there too small, and that's why we have to use the large one, a demonstration one. The body of this slide rule, the slip stick, and the precursor or runner, as it's called, this little piece that slides along with a line on it. Now, to, I want to examine the slide rule first by placing the slip stick parallel with the body of the, slide, of the rule. And we'll push the slider out of the way. I want you to examine, first of all, the scales. There are four scales here. Here's the A scale, the B scale, the C scale, and the D scale. The A and B scales are alike. You see they line up. And the C and D scales are alike. And they both start at the same point here with one. And the numbers run along so that the upper scales are just like the lower ones, only they're half as long. The lower scales here you see go from one to two there whereas the upper scales go from one to two in half the distance. Now for most operations, you use the lower scales because they're twice as accurate. They're twice as accurate. Now, to see how to use the slide rule, we first have to learn how to read a number when we find a position on it. So we're going to examine the different parts of the scale in, in parts, one at a time. Now let's start with the section from 1 to 2 in the A and B scales, from here to here. We see that interval is divided into five parts. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I should say 10 parts. The 10 parts. And each of the 
tenths divisions are divided into five parts from here to here. There are five intervals in each one of these. So you can look upon this as being one, and these as tenths, and these little intervals here to give you hundreds. But each interval here will be two hundreds because there are five of them in there. Suppose we had a reading here on the scale. This we would read as 1.4. 1.4 because it's over four tenths. Or if we had a reading here, it would be 1.6. Or if we had a reading here, it would be 1.62. This is two hundredths of the way from here to here. Or two tenths from there to there. Since these are tenths, that will be hundredths. 1.62. 1.62. Or if we had a reading here, that would be 1.96. 1, 1.9 1, is here, and this is 6. 1.96. Now, this interval then can represent one in a decimal, or it can represent a, a larger number, a smaller number. You, the decimal point makes no difference. This, for example, could be 14, or 140, or 1 and 4 tenths, as I said before. Now, suppose we had a reading here of 1, 6, 4. This could be 1, 6, 4. It could be 16 and 4 tenths, or 1.64. Now let's examine the next change in the scale, from 2 up to 5. Here, instead of having each tenth divided into 5 equal parts, it's only divided into 2 equal parts. So these represent 5 hundredths here, from here to here. A reading here would be 2.4, or 24, or 240. A reading here would be 2.7, or 270, or 27. Or here would be 3.8, 3 3.8, or 380. Notice here is a little line for pi, because often you have to multiply something by pi to get the circumference of a circle, or the area of a circle. So they tell you where 3.1417 would be. Now, let's go up to the next section of the rule between 5 and 1. It changes again. And now only, we have only our tenth divisions between numbers. Between 5 and 6, you see, there are only the tenth divisions. And we have to learn to interpolate. Now, this position would be 5.2. This position, 5.8. This position, 7.4. And this position, 8.4, and so on. Now when we get to 1, we see that the rule repeats itself. Between 1 and 2 is just the same as it was at the left-hand end of the rule, and so on with the rest of the scale. It repeats itself all the way down to the end. So we have two scales, one following the other, both alike. Now let's look at the C and D scales. They're the same as the upper, a little, a little like them anyway, and only spread out twice as far. Here's the 1 and 2 interval from here to here. And notice now the tenth divisions are not only marked with numbers, one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, and so on, but between you get in ten lines, so that they're hundreds. Now this position would be read 1.1 or 11 or 110. This would be 1.2, 12, or 120, or 1200, or 12,000. Now, a reading here, I get that right on there, would be 1.26 or 12.6 or 126. Let's go over to another figure here. This would be 1.55 or one, uh, 155. This would be 161 or 1 1.6, excuse me, 166 would be there, wouldn't it? 166 at that point, or 1.66. Now that from 2 up to 4, the slider out of the way, from 2 to 4, the scale changes again. And here's 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 3. Uh, this position would be 2, 4. And this would be 2, 5, 2, 7. This would be 2, 7, 4. So it's 4 tenths away from there to there. 2, 7, 
27.4 or 27.4, 2.74. And so on up, we would read that scale. Now from 4 all the way up to 1, the scale has changed again. That's because they couldn't get more lines in here and still read them. Here, this position would be 4.1, because there's 4 here and 5 there, 4.1. This would be 415. This would be 525. 525. And so on up to the end of the scale. Now that we have seen this parts of the scale and seen how to read them, we'll carry out some processes. Let's start with multiplication. And for a simple number to begin with, we'll take 2 times 3, just to illustrate. You all know the answer, of course. But we'll take the simple example so that you can see how to use the rule. And if, when you've learned, you've forgotten after a few days, always start with simple numbers. You know the answer to, and it will be easy to pick it up again. Now we're going to multiply 2 times 3, and that is equal to 6. Now what we do is start with this index, 1, on the C scale, and put it opposite our first number, which is 2. So we put this index on the scale opposite 2. Now line it up exactly right there. The index on the C scale opposite our first number. Then we follow along this C scale until we come to our second number. And our second number is right there. 2 times 3 is equal to 6. Now, usually, one would put the slider here on two on the three and read below it the six. But I'm using this pointer because it's a little easier for you to see. So two times three is six. Now, let's take a little harder product. Twenty-five times three, which you all can see gives seventy-five. Twenty-five times three, how would we do that? Our first number is twenty-five. So we come up here to our D scale and let this represent 20 and this represent 30. And 25 was here. So we put our index C right on the 25. And then we multiply that by 3. So we go along the scale to 3 and come down and we find 75. This would be 70, 80, 75. All right, now let's take a little harder number, 2.4 times 35. Now on the slide rule, you forget the decimal point until you get your answer. So this is the same as multiplying 24 times 35. Two significant figures times 2. 24 times 35. Now we come up to our rule, and here's 25. Here would be 24. So 24 is right here times 35 carries us over here. Here's 35 at this point, and right down here is 84. Now, in the answer, we don't know whether it's 84 or 8.4 or 840. So you write your number down here, and then you examine these figures, and you round them out to the even, even numbers. This is approximately 2, and this is approximately three, uh, 30. 2 times 30 would be 60. That tells us the decimal point is here. 84 is not far from 60. The decimal point goes there. Certainly, 2 times 30 is not going to give 6, nor is it going to give 600. 2 times 30 is 60. So it tells us the decimal point is there, not there, nor there. So you get the decimal point by inspection. Now let's take 2.6 times 5.5. 2.6 times 5.5. Now we go up to our scale, and we set this index on 2.6. And then we come along the scale, and we see we run off. We can't read our answer. So what do we do? We slip the stick back in the other direction. We come back to our two point, what did I have here? I set that on two seven, two seven, didn't I, instead of two six. Well, anyway, we're off the scale. So we come back with our index here to two six in the other direction. 
see if I get that right. 2526. 2.6 times 5.5. Now we go along the upper scale to our second number, and it comes right here, 5.5. So we come down here, and our answer is 1, 4. And now here we have to guess how far it is between there if we want to interpolate. Our answer would be 1, 4, 3. See, 1, 4 is to there. 1, 2, 3. 1, 4, 3. And we could say 2. But the three figures, it would be 1, 4, 3. So we write down 1, 4, 3. And then to find the decimal point, we examine these two numbers. You see, this is around 2 or 3, and this is around 5. Now, 3 times 5, or 2 times 5, would be 10 or 15. It tells us the answer has the decimal point here. It couldn't be 1. 2 times 5 is certainly greater than 1. And it certainly is not 140 or 143. So there is a decimal point. Now let's take a three significant figure number, like the one of the area of our rectangle. 345, you remember, by 234. 345 by 234. Now we slide this along. Here would be 300 and 40, and here would be 5. 345, we'd put our index right there. 301 to 4, and here's halfway between. 345 times 234. This would be 200, 10, 20, 30, and this would be 4, here. Now our answer is 8, here, I better put this slider on here now. 234 is right there. Now here's 8, and there's 8, 5, there's 8, 1. So it's not quite up to 1. We'd have to interpolate here. 8, 0, oh, this would be 8, 1, this would be 8, 0, oh, 7 or 8. That looks merely 7. So our answer would be, and we could write it down here, 8, 0, oh, 7. Now to find the decimal point, we round off the numbers. 200, roughly, times 300. 200 times 300 would give us 6, and then 4 zeros. So we see this should be 80,700. And you remember the answer we got was 807 something in here. These are not significant figures because this is only correct or nearly correct in the third significant figure. Now let's carry out division processes, see how they're done. Here again, we use the lower scales. And to take a simple example, let's take 6 divided by 3 equals 2. You can all do it in your head, of course. But let's try it on the slide row. Now this is the reverse process of multiplication. What you do is set these two numbers up on your C and D scales upside down. The 6 on the D scale and 3 opposite on the C scale. So we'll find 6, the numerator, and that is here. And then we'll bring along opposite it our denominator, 3. And then over on our index here, we find 2. Because you see 2 times 3 is 6. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Now let's take a little more complicated number. 28 divided by 4, which mentally you can see gives 7. 28 divided by 4. Now we we'll go up on this D scale and find 28. That would be here. Here's 30. That would be 28 divided by 4. We'll bring along 4, opposite it, and then look to the index that is on the rule. And the answer is 7. Now, if you'd gone the other direction to the other index, you'd find it off the rule. You couldn't read it. Now, let's take a little more complicated number. Uh, 675 divided by 121. Both have three significant figures. 675 by 121. 
I always set the top one up on the bottom scale. 670 would be there. 675 would be there. Now I'll put the slider there. That's the way you'd normally do it. 675 would be there. And then your other number, 121, is brought directly over it. Now here is 100 and 200. 121, there's 120 there. 121 is right under the slider mark. And the answer is right here. And that will be 5, 5, and about 8. 7 or 8 in there. You have to interpolate. This is 5, this is, six, one, this is 5, 5, 5, 6. 5, 5, 7 or 8. And the answer actually is 5, 5, 8. Now you get the decimal point here by looking again at the numbers. This is roughly 600 divided by 100. 100 goes into 600 six times. So that tells us the decimal point goes here. And the answer is really 5.58. Now here's a process using a little larger number, 9528 divided by 695. 9528 divided by 695 is 13.71. 9528. To do that, we'll go over the far right hand side and pick up 95. There's 96. 9528 would be about here. I better put the slider over that position and divide it by 695. So we find 6, and here's 869. 695 is right under the mark. Now this index is off, so we have to go way over to the left and find the answer here as 137. 137. We can't get the fourth significant figure because the slide rule in general is only good to three significant figures. So we get as an answer 137, and the examination of the figure shows its decimal point is here. Now, let's take the square roots of some numbers. Suppose we start with a square root of 25, which you all know is 5. Now, for this purpose, you put the scales and the sliding scale directly opposite each other. You don't have to do this, but you make, you're less apt to make an error if you slide them even with each other and leave them there. And then what you do is take your number, find it on the upper scale. We we'll go way over here to the left and examine this. Now, you don't know whether to go to the right-hand scale or the left, so we look first at some simple numbers we know. Here's a 4 and a 2. The square root of 4 is 2. You go over here to 9, you find the square root of 9 is 3. If you go along here, there's 15, this can be 16, the square root of 16 is 4. Now, we wanted the square root of 25, so here's 20, 30, there's 25, and the square root of it is 5. Now, suppose you wanted the square root of 400. You don't know on the upper scales whether to come to the 4 here or whether you go to the 4 on the other side. Now, the rule is this. If the number is between 1 and 10, you use the left-hand upper scale. Between 10 and 100, you use the right-hand scale. Between 100 and 1,000 between uh, in the left-hand scale. And you can do that by examination. Now, the square root of 400 says we should use this scale. And the square root of 400 is 20. So you take the square roots by finding your number on the top scale, and the square root of it will come out below. To square numbers, you just do the reverse process. You can either find your number here and read it off on the upper scale, which gives you the square, like of two is, square of 2 is 4 and the square of 3 is 9. Or you can multiply 3 times 3 or 4 times 4, whatever your number is, by using just the C and D scales alone, using the regular, regular multiplication process. Now a little practice with the slide rule should enable you to carry out these simple operations. Multiplication, division, square root, and squares. Lots of practice will save you a great deal of time. So get yourself a slide rule. You can all afford one.
cheapest ones are perfectly good and will, and will give you three significant figures. Examine them carefully when you go to the store to buy one. Line the scales up at the left and see that they agree with each other all along, that one of them isn't, hasn't shrunk a little. So get yourself a slide rule. Learn how to use it. It will save you a lot of time and energy.